Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about the interrogation of the Shaler Wolf, the first volume in Amblin Quaimalina's The Tribe series. Amblin Quaimalina is an Aboriginal Australian woman from the Paliku tribe in the Pilbara region of Australia. She's not only a writer for children and young adults, but also an accomplished lawyer. Her The Tribe series follows the story of 16-year-old Shayla Wolf, herself a girl with Aboriginal ancestors, and her friends as they shelter in the so-called first wood. They have to shelter there because of their abilities. All children with special abilities in the Shayla's world are put apart from society in detention centres and since Ashayla and her friends do not think that's fair and want to escape that kind of imprisonment, have escaped to an encampment in the first wood. The interrogation of Ashayla Wolf. The future is Australian. That's the title I chose for my first slide, and it's certainly a title that warrants some questioning. What does it mean, the future is Australian? Is the tribe series set in some kind of future Australia? Yes and no. The image you see here is from a forest in Australia and we are led to believe that the flora and fauna of the world Ashela lives in is certainly inspired by Australia. But it is but is it Australia itself? I don't think so. To see what I mean, I think it's important to have a look at how Ashela's world actually came to be. Well, 300 years before the events of the novel, a certain event happened, a catastrophe, more specifically, a climate catastrophe. This event is now called the reckoning. And it's framed uh, in two different ways. We will have a look at the quote now. Since a lot of people thought the reckoning was a holy judgment on humanity, it's likely they imagined angels because even if there were any gods, they didn't cause the reckoning. Everyone knows it was humanity's abuse of the environment that made the life-sustaining systems of the earth collapse. So what we can read from this quote is that, well, first, it's humanity's abuse of the environment, so exploitation of natural resources, uh, lack of respect for the animal kingdom, and so on and so on, that made the actually life-sustaining systems collapse. And that's that's an outcome that's not really that far-fetched. It's not really unrealistic. It's something that could very well come uh, to happen. That's the one explanation. It's a more scientific one. And the other is that it was a holy judgment on humanity. Uh, that's possibly more of a Christian point of view, especially because of uh, the angels that are mentioned. Uh, it could be seen as a kind of punishment for humanity's behavior but then again that could also be tied to the lack of respect for the environment and for nature what's interesting is that the tribe series seems to support both explanations kind of certainly there is a spiritual element to the reckoning but it is also very clear that it is caused by humanity itself speaking of spirituality interestingly we've got two different strands running through the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf. We've got this rather Christian imagery with the angels. We later learn about uh, Alexander Hoffman having left certain scriptures. And so that takes us a little bit towards uh, a scriptural religion like Christianity. But we also have Aboriginal spirituality, Aboriginal religions and beliefs that are more encapsulated by a Shayla, for example. Let's have a look at this world that came to pass after the reckoning. This is from the first novel where Shayla looks at a map on a wall. I studied the enormous map of the world that took up all of one wall. It was colorful and pretty, showing the single landmass that had emerged after the shifting of the tectonic plates during the reckoning, sitting in the center of the ocean that covered the rest of the Earth's surface. I focus on Gull City, which is near where Shayla lives and where she's from. My eyes following the road that led out of it and through to Gull City towns. 
Elder Gull, Esper Gull, Heli Gull, Stony Gull and Camber Gull. Then the grasslands and the first wood and beyond that Spinifex City and its towns Junifex, Cyberfex, Calfex. So it's very clearly not Australia. Australia doesn't exist anymore. There's only one big landmass that is all that's left from the continents that humans could live on. But it is, however, very reminiscent of Australia. Well, first, the idea of a landmass surrounded by water sounds Australian enough to me. But also, the flora and fauna is very clearly inspired by Australia. Spiny facts, for example, is a grass that grows there. And the first wood seems to be made out of tuor trees, which are also only found in Australia. Another thing that's interesting about this part is that the map here is only described by a shaler. If you have already seen our videos on maps, then you know that they're quite a common feature in speculative fiction. Granted, fantasy more than any of the others, but still, I find it interesting that here we don't have an actual map that we can look at, but we can see the map through the protagonist's eyes. Interesting how she focuses on the city much more than on the first wood, because the first wood seems like it should be her priority, but then again, it's known to her. So perhaps this is a subtle nod towards the fact that maps help us control the places that we don't know. As you know, this video is part of the session on utopia and dystopia. But what is the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf? Is it utopian or is it dystopian? Well, let's take a look. We already know that it's set after catastrophe and certainly it seems like humanity has tried to redeem itself. The society's professed goal is to live in harmony with ourselves, with one another and with the earth. Our existence strives to ensure that human existence never again puts the earth in jeopardy. The society itself is ruled by a number of councils, so it seems to be democratic, and they've put up certain accords that define how the society is run, that basically give the rules for, for how everything on a day-to-day -day basis works. You can understand now that our entire society is built on the need to preserve the balance. That's why we have accords in the first place. The necessities of life accords, which require the government of the seven cities to provide food, clothing, medicine and shelter for all. That sounds pretty utopian. The benign technology accords to ensure that we never develop the harmful technology that had such disastrous consequences for the old world such as nuclear power and the genetic modification of crops. Again, seems like a pretty good idea not to have nuclear bombs or anything like that. They also have the advanced weaponry accords to prevent the building of well, weapons. The collective transportation accords that make sure that people can go from place A to place B, can move between the cities with relative freedom and without harm to the environment. It's a train system. And they also have the three mines accords that are meant to protect the environment from extensive mining. There's only three mines that can be used to access natural resources. This is also something that ties the novel back to Australia itself because quite a lot of mining there has caused some environmental destruction. So that's certainly in there as well. But, and you've probably already seen the boldest quote there, we also have the Citizenship Accords to prevent illegals from upsetting the balance. Huh. What's that exactly? The Citizenship Accords states that every citizen has to be assessed at the age of 14. They are then classed into different groups of people. They could either be citizens, they could be illegals, or they could be exempt. Citizens are just the regular people who live in the society, whereas illegals are the people that, upon this test, are found to have special abilities. These special abilities are something that you can often find in fantasy literature or speculative fiction of any sort. We have people who can talk to animals, we have people who can create fire, people who can control the weather, people 
who can change the air. And we have a shaler whose ability is sleepwalking. Well, that doesn't sound too impressive, but what it actually means is that she has the ability of making her dreams come to pass in real life. This is actually already something that connects her to her Aboriginal Australian ancestors because of the very important concept of the dreaming. I would encourage you to look up that concept. It's by no means as simple as just referring to dreaming. It's far more complicated, complex and spiritually uh, filled than, it pre than it, the name seems to suggest. The name is, I have to say, an English translation. It doesn't perfectly reflect what is actually meant by it. And I personally am not qualified to explain it properly. So I suggest that you have a look at what Aboriginal Australians themselves are willing to share about this. Still, the fact that a shayla can dream and it's a shayla in particular who has the ability probably is a hint to uh, the term dreaming that is used in the English language. Exempts are those people with abilities who are deemed harmless. They may be able to heal people. They may have very weak or very uh, beneficial abilities that cannot in any way be used as a threat to the society. Now, so you can see that this is a very segregated society. And so there are, of course, people who are against that. We have citizens against detention, mothers of illegals, free the children, friends of detainees. And that's interesting because we have this kind of group or these kinds of groups in uh, real life as well. We have them in Australia, certainly. And the fact that the illegal children are put away, are put in so-called detention centres, seems to me to be an allusion to the current situation with illegal immigrants in Australia. You just have to look at the terminology that is used. We have citizens and we have illegals. That alone could push your thoughts into that direction. We also have them being put in detention centres, which is also something that happens to refugees, to illegal immigrants in Australia. And we have these groups, especially Free the Children and Friends of Detainees, who are basically a human rights group trying to protect these people. In the context of Australia, and especially the fact that Ashela has herself Aboriginal ancestors, and that this is also true for the author, we may also think about the stolen generations, children being taken away from their families please do check out our bus video on the stolen generations for that. The tribe, Ashela's friends, are escaping or have escaped from the society and they are living together in the first wood, trying to, pre to prevent themselves from being caught and put into these detention centers while also working towards a society where there's no longer a distinction between citizens and illegals, where children with special abilities will no longer be uh, detained. So did that answer the question? Is the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf a utopia or a dystopia? Well, kind of both, I think. Uh, this is certainly something that you can explore yourself for your assignments. Um, you may want to discuss this in the forum or write about what you think it is. I personally think it's a little bit of both. We certainly have the utopian elements, as I talked about before. We have certain dystopian elements, but we also have the author's own words about how she conceptualizes her own writing. So let's have a look at that. To write a dystopia is to write of the end of the world. But in an animate, interconnected existence where everything has consciousness and agency, Life is not easily overcome. Its nature is always to adapt, to change, to make itself anew, and in so doing, to remake everything else. This is the cry of the trees of the first wood. We live, you live, we survive. Everything lives and nothing dies. So ultimately, there's a message of hope in there that it isn't quite reconcilable 
with a dystopia as we would normally understand the term. Certainly everything in the trilogy strives towards making the world a better place. Well, I won't tell you how it ends, but you can tell from the quote that the author herself seems to be more optimistic and not prone to losing hope, certainly. Another thing that's interesting about this quote is the cry of the trees of the first book. That leads me on to another topic that we should talk about, and that's the topic of non-human characters in the Tribe series. The cry of the tree of, of the first wood is we live, we survive. So it speaks from the point of view of the trees and that already tells you that they have some kind of agency in the novels. They're certainly not the only non-human characters who have that though. If you read the further volumes in the trilogy, you'll find more and more non-human characters gain importance, but there are also a couple in the first novel that we are reading for this course. One of these are the saws. There were thin orange stripes running along its scaly body. That's how a description of one of the saws starts. And it was huge, so big that the top of my head was level with the top of its front legs. The beast flicked out a long blue tongue. A strange, raspy voice demanded, How do you know about the egg? My jaw dropped. The saw was speaking? So we've got these giant lizards who are roaming the, the space between the city and the first wood. And interestingly, they are also a connection to Australia because there is quite a lot of evidence that gigantic lizards once did crawl the land. And so that's maybe what Emberlyn Kermalina had in mind when she created the source. What it also tells you is that at first, Ashayla herself still sees them as just dumb animals, even though Ashayla is very much in favor of the balance and in favor of respecting the natural world, respecting animals as their own agents. Still, she calls them the beast. And then when the saw tries to communicate with her telepathically, she is surprised that it is speaking. And that's something that the novel does. It surprises the reader, but also Shayla sometimes with exactly how connected the world really is. And so it does show that even though animals may seem like they're mute, like they can't communicate, just because humans don't hear them doesn't mean that there isn't a voice to be heard. And the second quote on this slide refers to the first word itself. It also is communicating with the Shayla. And that might surprise you, but in fact, there have been a number of studies that do show that trees can communicate, mostly through uh, certain chemicals that they can exude from their leaves or from their roots. But in this case, they communicate with images to a Shayla. This is probably where the speculative part of it comes in. This is what makes it possible for Kwaimalina to, to make these voices heard. The voices themselves aren't fantastic. They are there. But the fact that a Shayla the human can hear them, that may be where the fantasy comes in. Images poured into my mind. Nightmarish pictures of things I'd never seen before. Strange vehicles with metal jaws, weird saws with teeth that roared, and humans, always more humans, cutting and hacking and slashing and killing, but the pictures kept on coming, filling my body with pain and my mind with the shocked confusion of dying forest. So the sharing of these images causes Ashela to see the world from the point of view of the trees. You as humans can probably tell that this is What's happening here is, is people trying to probably gain wood for whatever purpose they might have with cars and certain machines, saws, um, but which are here described as vehicles with metal jaws and saws with teeth that roar. So that's an imagery that suggests uh, nothing machine-like, but more nature-like. So that's where we can probably see the mind of the tree informing Ashela's thoughts. Now, the fact that 
non-human characters take such an important role in the tribe series. And later on, as I said, we have different kinds of non-humans come in as well. AI, artificial intelligence will also play a role. But the fact that this happens is based on Aboriginal beliefs, on indigenous Australian epistemology. You've heard before that the accords were set in place to protect the balance. The balance refers to a balance between humanity and nature, a balance between all living things, really. And this is what Byron Mulliner says about the, the idea itself. My great grandmother once described Australia as a place where everything lives and nothing dies. She was talking about a way of understanding the world as a web of living, interconnected beings where everything is born from and eventually goes back to the greater pattern of life itself. So that already tells you how deeply connected the tribe series is with Aboriginal thoughts, Aboriginal philosophy. And then Prime Molina also goes on, in, in such a world, the fact that we humans may not always understand the voices of other beings, the cry of the crow, the murmurings of rain or wind, or the slow rumble of rock, does not mean those voices do not exist. And that supports what I just said before, that the fact that animals or trees seem mute to us doesn't mean that they actually are. And they can all be seen as agents of their own who deserve respect and consideration. And so there's quite a, an ecological message in the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf as well. An ecological message that is supported by the author's own beliefs. The balance can also be connected to another concept that comes from Aboriginal Australians, and that's the concept of country. The first quote is by an, a white Australian eco-critical scholar, Kate Rigby, very interesting reading. She states that country is a spatial unit, extending under the ground, into the sky, and in coastal regions out to the sea which is forever in the process of being recomposed through the dynamic and by no means always harmonious or predictable interactions of its diverse human and non-human denizens. Country is sentient, agentic and speaking matter and its ongoing vitality is sustained through practices of care that are inextricably social and ecological, practical and ceremonial, ranging from seasonal burning to singing up, Caring for country demands considerable skill, knowledge, effort, and attentive love on the part of its people. So this is the white scholarly perspective of country, though she does acknowledge in her article that it is a concept that is established by Aboriginal Australians. But we should also have a look at what Primalina and other Aboriginal authors have to say about the concept of country themselves. This excerpt is from the introduction to a collection of essays on country. It's called Heartsick for Country. And it is actually written by our author, Amberlyn Quimelina, so it's quite interesting to have a look at what she says. This continent, named Australia by Captain Matthew Flinders early in the 19th century, is a land of many countries. And for every country, there is a people. She then continues to name a number of uh, indigenous Australian peoples and then goes on to describe how they relate to their land. We were formed with the hills and the valleys, the water and the sky, the trees and the plants, the crows and the kangaroos created by the ancestors who gave meaning and life to our world. And for each of us, country is not just where we live, but who we are. So this speaks of the very deep connection between Aboriginal Australians and the place they live in, they were born to. What it also does is it alludes to the ancestors who gave meaning and life to the world. And, and that's something that's also reflected in the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf. If you think of Grandfather Serpent, he certainly is one of these ancestors and actually tells a Shayla that he has sung the world back into being after the reckoning. So again, we have here a connection to Aboriginal Australian beliefs. In the same collection of essays, another author, Morgan, says that country is more than issues of land and geography. It is about spirituality and identity, knowing who we are and who we are connected to, 
and it helps us to understand how all living things are connected. It certainly helps us understand where the interrogation of Shayla Wolf is coming from as well. Having talked about the Aboriginal influences into Primalina's text, you'd be justified in wondering, well, then how is it speculative, right? Because you may be thinking of comparing it with other religions and you'd be right in saying that if I explained that uh, the Bible was fantasy fiction, I'd be disrespectful. And the same is of course true for uh, Aboriginal belief systems. But that's not what I'm saying when I say that the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf is speculative fiction, is an utopia and a dystopia at the same time. It's not the beliefs themselves that are fantasy. They have informed the speculative fiction texts, but that's something that happens with Christian writers of fantasy as well. I mean, no one would ever doubt that Aslan is Jesus, right? And that's, that's not me being disrespectful, that's just a fact. Aslan is both Jesus and the fantasy lion. I also feel confident in classing the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf as speculative fiction because the writer herself, Amberlyn Primaliner, very much sees herself as a speculative fiction writer. Here she says, I am often told that it is unusual to be both indigenous and a speculative fiction writer, but many of the ideas which populate speculative fiction books, notions of time travel, astral projection, speaking the languages of animals or trees, are part of indigenous cultures. One of the aspects of my own novels that is regularly interpreted as being pure fantasy, that of an ancient creation spirit who sung the world into being, is for me simply part of my reality. So what's in there is that what is interpreted as fantasy and what is not is very much dependent on who reads it. Certainly for Amber and Primalina, Grandfather Serpent isn't among the more fantastic elements of the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf. But it is being interpreted as such by readers who may not know its, its ties to Aboriginal epistemology. Still, she does call herself a speculative fiction writer, and that has a number of reasons. One being that speculative fiction may, of course, also refer to something that is real, but cannot be proven, something that is speculated about, which is why the term can be very useful. But also, there are other elements to her story that make her a speculative fiction writer. It's setting in the future, it's making audible animal or, or other non-human voices. Just just keep in mind that before, uh, on one of the, the previous slides, Primalina said that uh, the voices of rock, of wind and rain, of animals are not usually audible to humans. So making them audible is certainly a speculative or even a fantastic element. But Primalina also says that her fantasy comes in in imagining a world where good people work together as they do in the tribe series and that's also not necessarily something that can never be real and so uh, if anything the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf makes us question where we actually see the line between reality and fantasy and speculative fiction and realism it's certainly a very engaging tale. The entire trilogy is directed towards a young audience. It's a young adult dystopian trilogy. That's certainly what we can call it. Uh, it would certainly appeal to readers of The Hunger Games. And that's another strength of the novel, of the series, because it is appealing to a young adult audience. It makes those young adult audiences more acquainted with Aboriginal ideas, um, with Aboriginal epistemology, so ways of knowing, with Aboriginal ontology, ways of seeing the world. I hope this has given you uh, an adequate introduction to the novel and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about it.